Okay, welcome everyone. Is this very loud or is this going to be okay? You can all hear me at the back? Great, welcome. Um, it's great to see you all here, even on a Sunday, and even I just heard, despite the uh, fun run that's happening and some of the road closures and bridge closures, so thank you for, for making it all the way out here to Calvin Grove. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we are gathered today, the Yagra and Turbo people, north and south of the Brisbane River, and we pay our respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, this is our third community meeting and town hall um, to inform communities and inform you of what we've been up to, what we've been able to achieve with um, the fight against aircraft noise pollution, but also kind of looking forward um, into the rest of the year. This is a double election year. We are also, I think, quite tired of engaging in um, various um, submission processes, complaint processes. Now we have a Senate inquiry. Um, so we also want to see what else we are now willing to do in order to actually bring about the change that allows us to go home and live a peaceful life again and go about our busy, busy schedules. So what I've got planned, and I um, acknowledge and grateful for some of my fellow committee members to be here as well, um, we want to run um, through a couple of updates um, just to bring everyone onto the same page with regards to the Senate inquiry, the kinds of evidence we want to put forward, the kinds of evidence we'd like you to put forward to that Senate inquiry. We're talking about the local government elections a little bit. Um, we'll allude to the state elections coming up, and um, we also get a quick briefing from um, Sean, who's here on the um, updates um, with regards to the health research, the health study that we launched um, end of last year, and there's some more work that is um, coming out. And um, Tess might be able to give us an update on um, discussions had at the Airspace Advisory Board meeting that just happened this, this week, um, this last week. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, uh, the exit is the same way you came in, and then if you go around the corner to the left, the facilities are just there in the hallway. We've left the door open. It's like um, you can see a sign there, so it's just like 10 meters around the corner there. Um, whilst I'm standing here, I might just quickly uh, mention what this is, if you haven't seen it. On our website, we've published 60 reasons to protest. This was um, part of us preparing for the first BFPCA protest in June last year. And in, for the 60 days leading up to that date, we published a particular issue, a particular um, piece of evidence every single day for 60 days. If you're on the internet, you quickly scroll through them and it doesn't quite look as impressive as having them all in front of you. So maybe afterwards, um, come to the front, have a look at the um, diversity as well as the, the scope of some of the things that we are putting forward. And just for the Senate inquiry, we're focusing mostly on 10 of these. There's 60 in total. Just to kind of give you an idea of where the, um, the, the volume of material is at, and we are still contributing more to it, and I'll, I'll allude to some of that as we go. This isn't on the internet, um, but I'll, I'll encourage you to have a look as well. I've been uh, calling it the spaghetti map. Um, this is our internal draft of mapping some of the links and connections and the kind of nepotism that is happening between the airport, air services, corporate providers, suppliers, former regulators, politicians. It also includes um, um, romantic relationships and marriages, uh, which may not be in the public um, domain, but we managed to get a lot of accounts puzzled together to see that you know politicians are married to people working for the airport, which is a very handy relationship to have in some of these um, kinds of affairs, especially when it comes to lobbying and putting public pressure um, on um, various levels of government. So have a look at that one as well um, later on. Uh, I haven't prepared a formal PowerPoint presentation. What I'm doing is just actually walking you through material that is already on our website. And by doing so, it also means you can access all of this material yourself. And so the very first starting point is the homepage. And what we are doing on the homepage is um, 
put up these sliders uh, in order to highlight the current campaigns that we are running and we want to be focusing on. And the very first one now is the um, Senate inquiry. So we've been really, really um, lucky that this has come through. We've been pushing for this and it's been um, quite a mammoth effort over, what is it now, uh, three years or so, building up the community pressure through submissions, through um, political engagement in order to um, get the um, various political parties to agree to a Senate inquiry into aircraft noise pollution. And um, what we also want to, to do as part of this inquiry, um, put forward our um, allegations against air services. We, um, in the lead up to this, not only liaised with the Greens, we've also been liaising with the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure and Transport, that's Senator Bridget McKenzie. She's from the National, so she's part of the coalition opposition. Um, we also have um, fellow committee members who've been liaising with other parts of the entire political spectrum, both um, in terms of the colors um, horizontally, as well as the different levels of government vertically. So we've been meeting and talking to local councillors, we've been talking to state MPs, we've been also talking to the federal MPs. We've got um, Tess who might wanna mention a couple of words later about interactions with um, Peter Dutton, who's not only the leader of the opposition, but also happens to be the MP for Dixon. So it's right in his backyard as well that this debacle is unfolding. And then some of you might have seen updates on Facebook when we had meetings in Wynnum. There's um, Henry Pike and um, Ross Vasta, the federal MPs there. Um, very early on, we had um, a meeting with Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister, who's been very active in the lead up to his campaign. So this is all just um, evidence that um, BFPCA is, is very political. There's been some calls saying, no, 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 you, you must be apolitical. I said, well, no, this is a very political issue because what we want to do is change legislation. We want to introduce regulation. All of those things are political. So we cannot be apolitical. What we do want to be is nonpartisan. And so there is a difference between apolitical and nonpartisan. So we are very actively and explicitly and also unapologetically political because it is a political matter that we are fighting. But at the same time, we have um, committee members and we have campaigns that are reaching out across the political spectrum in order to engage all the incumbents, all the candidates that are in support of um, the community's demands. And that is our strategy of remaining nonpartisan. With the inquiry, we got um, now a website up on the um, parliament's um, um, web, so a web page up on Palin's website, there it is, Impact and Mitigation of Aircraft Noise. And one of the things, it's the practical matter that I encourage everyone to do, is to register and track this inquiry, because that means you get a notification of, um, I might just turn this down a little bit because it's very echoey, hopefully it's gonna work. How is this, is this still audible to you? Yeah? Um, so once you log in and um, you push that button, track the inquiry, you get updates whenever something happens. For instance, um, recently they made an announcement that the hearings in Brisbane are going to be scheduled for the 15th of April. And then the other update was that the submission deadline has been extended to the 30th of, of April. So those kinds of things. We expect there's going to be other hearing dates and um, other um, updates when um, submissions get uploaded when um, committee members are appointed, when people start to get invited to the hearings. So this is a good way to um, find out about the um, Senate inquiry. What we are doing right now is preparing our own submission as well as preparing for the hearing and we've also been asked to put forward recommendations for um, witnesses, for experts, for community members that will be invited to those hearings. This is not limited to us though. So if you do feel comfortable, um, not just attending a public hearing, but actually being invited to speak, um, the best way to do that is to put yourself forward, either through your own submission or by simply emailing the secretariat. There is a um, web link, uh, an email link down here. So it's um, this one down there at the bottom. And you can self-nominate as well. 
That is going to be really useful because the senators will want to hear not just from us. So please don't think, oh, BFPCA got this. They will do the submission, Mark is going to attend, and then, you know, everything is going to be hunky-dory. We really got everyone to chip in and make this a community issue, not just BFPCA um, is um, banging on about this. We need everyone to back us up. Partly because experience from Senate inquiries has shown that is really, really needed to show the volume and the um, emotional level of support that is required. So um, providing accounts of your own personal experience is, is really, really important. What BFPCA will then do is back that up with all the kind of technical data that we've accumulated. So we've got you know, all of this. You don't have to go through all the details of what we've been um, accumulating. You can express your support for the kinds of outrage that you might want to um, put into your submission about what we found. And I'll give you a couple of glimpses to make you you're really angry. So for those that have low blood pressure, it's going to be your morning. For those that have high blood pressure, we'll turn up the aircon. The um, other reason why I think it's going to be really important for everyone to have a voice is because the committee that oversees this inquiry is made up of all the political parties. So whilst the Greens have been very supportive, our own political strategy is to liaise with all of them, which means we also got to um, anticipate backlash from um, the government as well as some of the opposition senators. For instance, um, the Shadow Minister has been great in Senate estimates. We've had several meetings, Tess attended them, some other committee members attended them. They've been very, very supportive. But one thing they've said up front is no curfew and no flight caps. The nationals are not standing for that. So whilst they are going after air services, and you've seen some of the videos we've shared on Facebook in the hearings, how you know, Bridget McKenzie has been interrogating the CEO of Air Services, Jason Harfield, and some of his um, fellow executives. Um, we have to keep in mind that two of our key demands is caps and curfews. And the shadow minister is not the person, and uh, the nationals are not the party that will support that. And that's what they've um, quite transparently expressed in their scorecard uh, leading up to the federal election, as well as in person to us when we met with them over several times. So the chair of this inquiry is going to be Matt Calvin, um, who is the um, Queensland senator for the Nationals. Um, so we've got to keep in mind that when we, do do, uh, when we do do those submissions, they're going to be read by a whole cross-section of the political spectrum. Um, the more evidence we can put forward that they can't refute, the better our position is going to be that we're not ending up in a situation where there's going to be um, excuses, exemptions. Um, in Senate inquiry land, there is um, reports, and then there can be dissenting reports, which is when they don't agree on matters. Once we have that situation, we might um, find ourselves kind, kind of split because they will point fingers at each other saying, this is, you know, the Greens are just politicizing this or um, weaponizing this. So the more of us can actually put forward your own personal accounts, um, how this affects you, um, the better it will be. If you happen to have expertise, and we've already tapped some people on the shoulder, um, that can add extra weight, then the better. And Sean will, for instance, give us a, um, um, an example of personal expertise in uh, Sean's case in environmental science and in research. But another example, for instance, is a um, um, fellow supporter who came forward who happens to be a surgeon at the Children's Hospital in Brisbane. And he sent a very powerful email because he said that his hand is shaking so much from not being able to sleep at night that he cannot um, operate on um, open heart surgery on children and babies because of where he lives and how the uh, noise is affecting him. So when the airport and air services talk about the economic development and the growth and we just got to suck it up, there is some very powerful accounts of us not just being sitting there and collecting pensions and centering payments. We are the economic powerhouse of the city. 
It's affecting 226 suburbs. That's not just people living there and playing um, pool. That's people working, studying, caring, um, being in um, facilities for various reasons, and um, that is all part of the argument we need to put forward. Because that cannot be easily um, politicized by saying this is a left or right issue. This is affecting everyone. It shouldn't be something that only the, um, the left spectrum fights for. Um, the fight against corruption and um, unethical behavior should be a cross-party line, something that we want to um, nip in the bud. I'll give you a quick um, overview of the 10 reasons, and I'm only gonna focus on two of them. So there's 10 that we've put forward in the um, campaign website that a lot of you have submitted in the lead up to the inquiry. So you might, have recall, you might recall that uh, we asked everyone to send emails to the um, opposition, Greens, and crossbench senators saying we really, really want this inquiry. And that email already alluded to these 10 reasons. One of them is the fact that complaints to air services go nowhere. Very early on, we submitted an FOI request, a Freedom of Information request, that um, resulted in them releasing their training manual to us about how complaints are handled. And you can go to our site, click on the blue link, read up about the detail, but in essence, your complaints are not going anywhere. Um, the training manual is very detailed on how the complaint specialists, they specialize in stonewalling you. They will use boilerplate responses. They will say, there's nothing we can do. Brisbane is a 24-7 airport. There's no legislative requirements in Australia to um, argue that there is an upper limit. There is no upper limit. And they're actually right. Um, we've also backed this up through questions and Senate estimates where senators asked air services, how many complaints have been submitted? And I think the latest number is in the vicinity of 27,000 just for Brisbane formal complaints that have been registered. That's a cleansed figure, because if you submit multiple complaints, you won't be counted. So even with all their cleansing tactics, it's in that vicinity. Now, the next question the senator asked, how many of those led to a noise improvement investigation, which is a provision in this training manual that the complaint specialist can take an idea from the community and then take it forward. Can you say, how about um, steeper departures, right turn, left turn, curfew, whatever it is? You might have seen this already online. Guess how many have been um, investigated? None. Not just in Brisbane. They said none in the entire country. Right? So it begs the question, if this provision is in their training manual, what is it for if it's never been used? So the, the stonewalling is one item. Um, Sean, do you want to, um, because the next item here is about the mental health impact and the, the wider health impact, are you happy to give us a quick update maybe with um, the, the mic? And I'll switch to the, um, the health report page. Good morning. Good morning all. Marcus, thank you. I want to start off in a little strange little place here. Marcus has just given us some background on what's happening to people in Brisbane. I've been asked to give a presentation at BACAG, which is the, the talking shop at the airport that happens four times a year. Jeff has previously been a member there. We've got Tess there that, that works on another talking shop called AAB. And I've been struggling with how I make a presentation to the people that are responsible for causing the problems. They're not exactly friends for us. So I've been struggling with words, and, and Tess, you're great as a, as, a, as a documenter. Would people like to suggest one or two words that describe what's going on? All right. I've, the words I've come up with so far is, for instance, it's cruel, yeah? If you go beyond that, it's deliberate cruelty. So would people please make suggestions right now? Ridiculous, Ridiculous? okay. Relentless. Relentless? Relentless? I hope you're getting these, Tess. 
Sorry, coward? Harrowing. Harrowing. Other ones? Disheartening. Disheartening. Yeah. Powerless? Impotent? Irresponsible. What? Irresponsible? Harmful. Say again? Harmful. Harmful, certainly. Criminal. Criminal. Okay. We're getting closer. It's not right. Not right. Unethical. Unethical. Deceit. Deceitful. Immoral. Okay. Let's go, go back. Last year, we completed a study on looking at the extent and severity of aircraft noise in Brisbane. Some of you may have read it. It's on our website. But we've got a quarter of a million fellow sufferers out there. That's under the severe severe flight paths, two flight paths overhead. We happen, we happen to be under, in Balmoral under two flight paths, day and night. Other people, there's a half a million people in addition that are under one flight path. So all of these people, that's three quarters of a million people, a big slab of Brisbane's population, are getting hit with, with pretty severe aircraft noise seven days a week. What does it do? Well, it causes heart disease, it causes strokes, it can exacerbate diabetes, and on the, on the non-medical side, um, it certainly is causing a lot of mental distress. There's some people who are having su suicidal ideation as a result of it, lots of family stress, lots of disruption in schools, happening all the time. And the numbers we're talking about are very significant. Normally, if you had a, a, a problem like this that affected a big slab of a major city, the government would have done something about it. If you had as many people in Brisbane affected by road, road crashes, collisions, they would certainly be doing something about it. But nothing is being done. So we, we've done that. We've done the work. It's been, it's been put about. Um, I'll talk about it when I speak to Backag. Um, but we've gone on from there because one of the groups that we know are most affected by aircraft noise are school kids and, of course, the teachers. So there are about 100 schools that are under one or, one or two flight paths. And that adds up to about 100,000 students, which is about 40% of the school kids in Brisbane. And there's been plenty of research done in the US and in Europe that shows that aircraft noise, as compared to other noises like traffic noise and construction noise and so on, is the most disruptive. The teachers can't hear the students, the students can't hear the teachers, the kids have difficulty concentrating, and as a consequence, it slows down their cognitive development, slows down their reading development, and can have lifelong effects. So this is a generational problem. It's not just us, yeah? It's your nieces and nephews and grandkids that are also being affected. So when someone says this is unethical, it truly is unethical. And this is the line that I'm increasingly taking. Marcus has made the point that there are no regulations. But hopefully, ethics have not disappeared as well. So Marcus is suggesting that we confront the airport, Brisbane Airport, and the airlines and the government with the reality of this being an ethical issue. And the government needs to, to watch its ethics and make sure that it is looking after its citizens, which it is not doing right now. So please, if you've got other suggestions for words to describe what's going on, I'd be happy to hear them. Please let Tess know because she's, she's getting them all down and um, this is where we're going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, the third item that we've put forward in our call for Senate inquiry is around the staff shortages, which are largely self-made by air services as part of the, the pandemic and redundancies a voluntary retirement scheme that was introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you might have seen some of the media coverage around this. Now, that is quite an interesting one because it seems to be 
the one item that is uniting even the industry with us in establishing common ground to try and um, go after air services. So one of the interesting pieces of intel that we've heard from the shadow minister is that they have been liaising with airlines and with the Australian Airports Association and airports, and they don't like air services either. And you can guess why. Because the staff shortages that they fabricated is leading to cancellations, it's leading to delays. In fact, at the time that we had the hearing, um, it was um, two air traffic controllers in Sydney that didn't rock up at, uh, to work and it paralyzed the entire country. So the industry is concerned about air services being a complete dog's breakfast for other reasons, but we believe there is common grounds because we are now looking at airlines being um, going, going after air services, airports going after air services. We have Civil Air as the union that represents the air traffic controllers. They haven't been happy for a long time. Um, also due to um, the ongoing matter of sexual harassment and bullying that has already been subject of a previous inquiry with, um, with the Senate. And we are now adding more weight into this um, debacle. So that will be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, we've put uh, forward the argument around technical incompetence. Um, we've um, seen that Trax has been uh, reappointed as consultants from the UK to help air services with phases three and four of the um, Brisbane Noise Action Plan, as they call it. But Trax have already been here before. Part of our community pressure leading up to the federal election meant that Barnaby Joyce at the time in his role of Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport Infrastructure made over half a million dollars available to get these consultants to come into the country, look at the handiwork that air services have been up to for 13 years, and it only took them six weeks to identify 49 ways that this particular um, piece of work could have been improved. And so our very first question is why? Why does it take half a million dollars, consultants from overseas, to come in here for a short period of six weeks to quickly identify 49 ways that air services work could have been improved when they uh, are telling the senators it's their bread and butter. Doesn't seem to be their bread and butter. So that is um, a, a point that we are putting forward. We've heard about the SOP props um, debacle, which is the mode used to operate entirely over water, where one runway is used for arrivals, the other one used for departures over water. And what happened is that in the lead up right before the launch of the new airspace architecture, that mode was entirely removed from the noise abatement procedures in Brisbane um, between the time, the daytime hours, so from, from 6 um, a.m. to 10 p.m. Without consultation, without really telling anyone, without going back to the minister and asking for reapproval. Um, they conveniently self-assess this as a minor change. Well, it turns out, and we are now the, the lived experience of it, it turns out that it wasn't a minor change at all. It was very, very major. So we also want to go back to this particular decision where they self-assessed it as a minor change because we believe that was commercially motivated. There is misleading noise data, which um, would probably fill up an entire lecture of how the both the forecasts as well as the monitoring right now is misleading. Um, I'll just give you a glimpse. There is a particular approach that is probably tested from the 70s or at least from the 80s. It's very old. Um, that's called ANEF, which is the Australian Noise Exposure Forecast. So you might have seen this in the form of um, contour maps, which is like lines drawn on Brisbane. And you can still see them in the um, Brisbane City Council um, local government plan because there is a, a layer for these um, overlays of ANF contours. But the misleading part to it is that a lay person will look at this map, they will want to know are they in or are they out, right? Am I inside the contour or am I outside the contours? And so when you're outside the contours, you think I'm okay. You don't necessarily look at the details of the numbers, the disclaimers, the fact that they are saying, but you can be exposed um, 
three kilometers left and right of any flight path and so forth. So part of the problem is this ANAF approach that Australia has been using for decades now is flawed. But again, to make matters worse, the government knows it's flawed because we've been looking at um, the historic archives of inquiries and there is three, one in 2000 and two in 2003 that predate the Brisbane approval for everything we are talking about. So the approval for the new airspace architecture, the new parallel runway, et cetera, it's from 2007. So there's three reports that say how to do it better, how to not um, redo the mistakes from what happened in Sydney during the 90s. You might recall there were ongoing protests in Sydney in the 90s that led to a lot of the community protections that Sydney siders are enjoying. And part of that legacy is also that these reports were produced that says this is how you need to do it and this is how you don't do it. What did air services and the airport do? They did it exactly not the way the reports recommend. They just went ahead and did the same thing because it suited them. Um, what came out recently, and I'll quickly show you this graphic because I think this is one that really makes your blood boil, is the way that we, they think that we're all stupid. <laughs> Has anyone watched that very entertaining episode of Senate Estimates? It was actually, in this case, um, Senator Janet Rice. Um, she's a senator from Victoria who's been cutting her teeth fighting for um, Melbourne communities with regards to aircraft noise exposure. And we've briefed her quite in a level of detail about some of the technicalities with something that's called the noise improvement trial. So one of the um, concessions, if you'd like, concessions and quotation marks, one of the concessions that we got out of Barnaby Joyce as a bit of a, you know, we'll throw you a bomb, um, in the lead up to the federal election 2022, where these noise improvement trials, and one of them was that they're gonna be prohibiting intersection departures at Brisbane Airport. So if you think, you know, I'm a plane and this is my runway here, an intersection departure is where they go on the taxiway and because there might just be a small, um, small aircraft or a propeller or whatever, they can take off with a shorter length of the runway. So they go into this intersection here and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to take off. Okay. By preventing that from happening, all the planes have to go to the beginning of the runway over here and they can take the entire length of this runway. Now, if they have all this bitumen, all this concrete, all this length ahead of them, what can they do? They can go faster, they can build more thrust, and with more thrust, you can go steeper, higher. When you're higher, less noise for communities. Now, that is the case everywhere in the world, except Australia. We are a um, science anomaly. That's what the Air Services executives um, have been telling senators previously, and we kept going back to them and saying, you really go, you have to go after those bastards because they are blatantly lying and holding parliament in contempt. So this time around, we finally got their admission that the reason why they're not going higher is because they asked the pilots to maintain the same height markers that they aspire towards. So say if that speaker there is my height marker, then as a pilot, I'm sitting here and entering data in my flight computer we are weighing, you know, um, 300 tons with cargo and passengers, and this is how much runway I got, and this is where I'm gonna aim for. That means I need less thrust because there's more runway and I don't have to go very, very high. I'm just gonna go there, same as before. So the reason why there has been no noticeable, discernible outcome from this noise improvement trial is because they kept the planes on the same altitude as before, which then obviously means that if the plane flies over the same communities at the same altitude, then they will experience the same level of noise. They could then use this argument to get rid of these um, um, very annoying um, intersection departure prohibitions because they don't like them. 
The airport likes to have a queue here. It's like being at Woolies at the checkout. If you only have one queue, it's a long queue. But if you have two checkouts, the you know, full length checkout, and then bing, bing, checkout two is open. Then the planes can line up at this conveyor belt and go up there, and they can just schedule them much more efficiently. Now, the airlines and airports love efficiency because it means more throughput. But what they actually need to admit is that there is a conflict of interest. They're optimizing all their decisions for commercial profit and their own corporate benefits. And they're blatantly lying to the public and to senators about their real motivations and objectives in here. So whilst this sounds like a minor thing, it's like one of the few where they finally admitted in, uh, in Senate estimates um, the kind of unethical practices that they are following in order to do the bidding for their mates in the aviation industry and throwing us under the airbus. So that is one of the things we'll want to put forward, which is item eight here. They are captured by the aviation industry. There's a breach of the Air Services Act. Um, I'll also quickly show you this one, which um, will also make your blood boil, I, I think. Um, this case, um, Turnbull was a good guy. With all the nonpartisan, I have to actually kind of defend the actions from 2007 because in his foresight, Malcolm Turnbull, in his role at the time of uh, being the environment minister, he attached a condition to his approval of the airspace um, redesign in Brisbane. And we've, through FOI requests, got um, all the communication back and forth between the minister and air services and the airport. And if I zoom in here, you can see what it says there. Air services should take account of the options to mitigate noise impacts outlined in the draft EIS and supplements. And, and this is important, require validation of the uncertainties inherent in the forecast when conducting the safety case environmental assessments prior to the operation of the new power runway. This was um, usually, this is what's called an EBPC referral, an Environmental Protection Biodiversity Act um, referral. There is a public register where these referrals get listed and documents that are affiliated and relevant to those referrals get attached. For some reason, um, we never knew this even existed because up to the inquiry we had with the Aircraft Noise Ombudsman, we've only ever dealt with the referrals that the airport submitted for the concrete in the ground. And the referral numbers that air services um, submitted, they were not on the public register. So we thought, this is strange. There is these odd numbers that are mentioned in the um, Aircraft Noise Ombudsman report. And I noticed at some stage that these numbers don't add up to the ones we've been dealing with. So I've like, been doing some um, sleuthing and uh, searching. And it turns out that they were removed from show. So when we asked the department, so here's like everything is public, but this one isn't public, what's going on? Oh, we don't know, must be a inconsistency, some sort of discrepancy, not really sure. So then we went and had to um, submit a freedom of information request as well. Eventually we got the whole um, dialogue, the whole correspondence between the department, um, air services, the minister, and BAC all patched up from three or four different FOIs. And it turns out what air services did to meet Malcolm Turnbull's ministerial condition, they outsourced this to the airport. So Air Service said, look, we are really busy. Our bread and butter is to, you know, have a jolly good time here. Um, can you help us, BAC, because we need to make this go away? And BAC said, of course, no worries, we can help you. We're going to fabricate um, some bogus data and some report that is um, full of furfies about how there is no need to do any more forecasting modeling or going back to the drawing board. We're just going to rejig the old data from 2007, put um, our company logo on it, and here is our what's called the BAC noise comparison report. And Air Services said, thank you very much. That's great, exactly what we need. We're just going to take the whole thing, put it on our letterhead, and in 2018, they sent it off to the um, minister and the department and said, 
job done. And the department says, ooh, job well done, here's a star. No scrutiny applied, no questions asked about the conflict of interest that the project's proponent is marking their own homework. Right, so of course that noise comparison report is very favorable, suggesting that there is no discrepancies, it's all hunky-dory. Now, 2018, the flight paths hadn't been finalized. They hadn't been finalized until 2020 when the last airspace change proposal was submitted to CASA. So when we look at the timeline, they've kind of said we are done, we've met all our requirements at the time when they were still fiddling around um, flight paths. In fact, the ones that are going all the way out on the instrument landing system and the sits and stars that are elongated over Upper Brookfield, Sanford Valley and so forth, they weren't really on the, on the picture. And this is part of the reason that they managed to get this through after the fact that the minister's conditions had been declared to have been met. What do you think of that? Any more adjectives to add to the list that Sean produced just now? Who watches um, Current Affairs or Four Corners or one of these things? Do you think it's up there? Is that kind of this kind of stuff that meets that requirement? We, we think so. Okay, so this is um, some of the things we want to put forward in the Senate inquiry, but um, I also wanted to give you a couple of glimpses. So we've looked at the um, noise improvement trials. We looked at um, the uh, minister's approval. There are 60 of them. I know it's a lot to take in, but if you're really interested of what's really going on here, we're not just NIMBYs because we are you know, uh, complaining about some nuisance about a um, plane or two flying over our homes. This is blatant, unethical um, conduct. It's uh, misleading the public trust, and we also believe it meets the definitions of corrupt conduct under the new uh, NACC, the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So if you go to the NACC, they have three criteria and you be the judge, you know? Look at this material, look at the three criteria, and you tell me whether this is corrupt conduct or not. We believe it is, but a lot of people think it's the C word that must not be mentioned in Australia. Well, we think it needs to be mentioned because we need to call um, this what it is. Now, on a rosier note, I don't know. <laughs> Um, do you want to um, get these ones maybe distributed? Maybe I'll ask um, Martin to do that. Can you do that? Ah, oh, you've already got one? Oh, great. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Excellent. <laughs> so I quickly wanted to give you a bit of context to our scorecard approach. We've done the scorecard for the federal election. We've done it now for the local government election. And we um, are planning on doing this for the state election. This is pretty much just BFPCA doing a service um, for the community because what we do is we identify issues that are within the remit of um, the government that is being re-elected. So whether it's the federal level, the local level in this case, and now next time it's gonna be in October, the state level. Um, so the six items that you see there on the side, they're not randomly picked. They're actually items that are within the remit of a local government. We then write to the uh, incumbent and to the um, candidates um, as we are able to identify them and we ask them where they stand on those issues that we've identified. And then we hope that they write back to us. In the case of the local government elections, Labour and the Greens wrote back to us. The LNP originally did not write back to us, which we then um, um, used as a way to interpret their current actions in the absence of their formal response. A week later, we did get a response, so we've updated this scorecard now to reflect the response that we've received. There's a couple of things to point out. One is we ask everyone to read those letters because we are interpreting it in a very um, generous way but you need to apply your own scrutiny to what they are saying. We are also not telling you who to vote for. This is really just the guidance. I don't, you know, and no one on the committee really cares um, where you're gonna put your, your, your crosses 
Um, this is really just information and a way for us to elicit that information from the candidates and incumbents of where they stand. Now, there's two kind of misconceptions that we get a lot um, in response to this. One is, oh, you're just promoting the Greens. No, we're not. We're actually asking all the parties where they stand, and we respond by putting that into the scorecard, and we publish their letters. If you think the Greens will never be able to achieve what they are setting out to achieve, then don't vote for them. If you believe that Labour is the best bet, or if you believe the LNP is the best bet, then vote for them. If you are a member of the blue or the green or the red team, attend their branch meetings, ask them about these things, bring it into the conversation when policies are being discussed, uh, make submissions in your own right if you're not happy with any of their responses, but don't complain to us. We get lots of complaints and people unsubscribe from our mailing list saying, oh, you're putting Labour or LNP or whatever into a bad light. Well, no. If you look at the letters, this is what, how they've responded. They've ruled out certain things. They've said they would do certain things. We also get the reverse compliance. We are, you know, we, people are saying, oh, the LNP got two green ticks, but they are currently in power in town hall. Why aren't they doing these already? They are in government. They're, they're running Brisbane City Council. How come they haven't done number one and number, um, number four? So again, you've got to read those letters to interpret what they are saying, and you've got to make up your own mind. Um, when it comes to local government remits, yes, we hear all the time, in fact, the letter we sent to the candidates started off by saying, we completely acknowledge that aviation is a federal matter. But there are certain things that are within the remit of local as well as state governments, and we have been asking them about those. In this case, for instance, um, not whether they're going to legislate a curfew and flight cap, but whether they are supportive, which means, for instance, that they could use their membership on BACAG and their relationship with the airport to exercise pressure on supporting the community's demands. We know that they can't legislate this because it's not in their legislative remit. Similarly, when it comes to drone delivery services and air taxis, and you might have seen some of the more recent media coverage that air services is making it easier for those operators to introduce services into the Australian airspace, local governments have a big role to play and you might have seen those photos of Adrian Schrinner um, presenting an air taxi outside town hall. Right? So if it's completely outside the remit of a local government, why is our current Lord Mayor inviting the company that he has signed a memorandum of understanding with to come out in King George Square and set this thing up before a big PR press show with media coverage and yada, yada, yada. Right? So there are a number of things local governments can do. In the lead up to the state election, we are thinking we will focus on health. As Sean has mentioned, um, there is obviously um, quite a big issue um, correlating the aircraft noise pollution with health impacts, and health is a state matter, as well as learning and education, as well as land use planning, because uh, the urban town planning provisions that local governments have to abide by are uh, put in place by, by state, uh, state governments. So coming up to, to Saturday, um, this is really just a guide. Um, you also got to consider other policy options that are outside this remit, um, whether, you know, obviously the candidates and the incumbent, they also stand for other things that are completely outside our current interests of aircraft noise pollution when it comes to planning, when it comes to the Olympics. So you got to weigh these things up. You might kind of say, you know, Look, we believe that you know, the impact of um, any of these parties doing anything in the aircraft noise space is very limited. I'm going to vote on the basis of where they stand um, for Kirilpa, for West End, for the Olympics, right? That is completely up to you. So this is our approach to these scorecards. Before I move on, any questions about this particular, this particular matter or any of the responses or the way that we've interpreted what they've said? Um, we haven't 
we haven't seen the actual MOU that they've signed. We've um, seen it covered in the media. The MOU was signed uh, also not by Brisbane City Council, but by um, an entity called the South East Queensland Council of Mayors, which is like a peak body that brings all the mayors together, and Brisbane is a member of that, and that entity is a company. It's an incorporated entity, and so they have signed this um, MOU with um, a company called Risk. Risk is the, I think they're actually attached to, um, to Google, to Alphabet, Google. Um, whether there is um, commercial um, kickbacks, we can only assume that there's gonna be some of those uh, involved in order to enable them to be fast-tracked. Because the thing that we've um, seen covered in the aviation industry, magazines and press, is that a lot of these providers, drone delivery services and air taxi providers, they love Australia. In fact, some of the test cases here are the best ones in the world, even better than the test cases they're running in the US and in Israel. Because here, there's no regulation. They can do whatever they want. So they're already flying in Logan and Ipswich. And if you look at some of the videos that we've put on the, on the website, there is a, a number of communities now um, forming and creating um, resistance to the fact that there was no engagement, there's no regulation, and so they have these drone flight paths at about 70 or 80 meters altitude where someone would order their Starbucks coffee um, or their Domino's pizza, and it goes over their head. So I think there is obviously commercial considerations. The other thing to watch out for is if you live close to a Bunnings or Office Works because they are thinking of those car parks um, as a great location for what they call drone ports, which is where they take these kind of two or three car parks at the very end of the Bunnings car park, and they turn them into drone ports. So then the drones go up and down from this spot. The delivery drivers go there, usually office works, Bunnings kind of stores, they, are, they have good connections. So then food delivery drivers go there, the drone takes it somewhere else, and so all of a sudden, if there's a, you know, a particular restaurant that you want to order from, then you, it, it goes via drone. So it's like, you know, the, the cyclist or moped goes to the drone port, the drone takes it further, and then there's another Bunnings where they drop it off, and then it goes the last mile. So you can see where this, is, where this is going. And by the time that we wake up to this, they've already signed contracts and they had their little you know, ad in the Courier Mail on page 48 on a Sunday that we hadn't noticed. And they said, oh, well, you didn't pay attention. So we got to really watch the space because whilst they are saying, oh, this is great for the Olympics, once it's here, it's very hard to fight this to make this go away again. Any other questions around the um, items on the, on the scorecard? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm trying to get the air con to run again. So because we are very, very imminent with the local government elections, we didn't want to add more issue, like more um, campaign material or matters into the um, this one is, yeah, I know. There's only one button to push, which is like <laughs> most of these systems. Like complain, 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 nothing comes. Okay, I don't know what, what's going on. Um, so yeah, because we are so close to the local government elections, we've actually been holding off doing anything else just because people start to get confused if we have too many things going on. And uh, a lot of them we can't influence. So the fact that the Senate inquiry is now overlapping with the local government elections, and we've also had the Commonwealth Ombudsman respond to us at the same time, has already created enough confusion where people have been emailing us saying, what is going on? There's like, you know, these messages coming from Bridget McKenzie, from the Commonwealth Ombudsman, and then we are messaging them. And so we've been holding the, uh, that off until um, some of the things have cleared up and our desk has cleared up, but we are hoping that with the state elections coming up in October, that we would probably start issuing our scorecard around August, September. Um, if we are doing it much, much earlier, people also don't necessarily see the relevance yet. So a lot of the people that are paying attention now to the local government elections, like the media coverage, for instance, has only really started to focus on these issues in the last two, two weeks or so. So we are trying to, it's like being at the beach and, you know, body surfing. You've got to catch the, the wave in, in the right spot. 
That's, um, that's with regards to state. With regards to federal, that's like an ongoing process. Um, when we were in Canberra, um, I have been asking whether the um, office of the shadow minister, so Bridget McKenzie's office, whether she can lend some help getting, for instance, a response out of David Crisafulli, who's the um, um, leader of the opposition at the state level. Uh, and we've already sent two letters to him without that we got an adequate response. Um, and Tim, I was, I'm very grateful for Tim, um, for his support on the committee, uh, because he's been leading some of this. But pretty much the response has been, we're not interested. It's not a state matter for us. And so we haven't even had an opportunity to sit down with them and brief them on the issues, because right now they are just going after youth crime. And this is just a distraction for them. The more people write to um, David Christofulli, for instance, to bring this up, the better the chances are for this to eventually get airtime at the state level. Um, so we'll be looking at strategizing around this um, leading up to the state elections in um, October. I think it's, when is, what's the date? The 26th, is it? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. And we have seen on a number of occasions that they are, though, using that as an excuse, not wanting to do anything about it. And we've got to remind them that whilst there is a separation of governments, there isn't really a separation of parties. So um, John T. Bush, a Labour MP at uh, um, state level, been saying, oh, it's not really something I can do. Well, no. You can pick up the phone and call your comrade, Catherine King, in Ballarat and say, what gives? Why are you just meeting with the industry um, senior hegemons at Brisbane Airport all the time and not a single time with us? She doesn't front up the communities. Oh, is she? There we go. Oh, she wasn't this last, yeah. So yeah, we do see those, you know, in, in hindsight, we then see the announceables with hard hat and uh, that kind of thing. But um, on various occasions, um, the MPs have been asking her, meet up with the communities, whether it's with us or even to doing a town hall meeting like this, um, no, they refuse. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a very good reminder. And similarly, um, the same applies to the other parties. So whilst we, we refer to the LNP in Queensland, because in Queensland they are called the Liberal National Party, at the federal level we are referring to the coalition, which is though more or less the same thing, which is the coalition between the Liberal Party of Australia and the Nationals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I'll, um, I'm kind of wondering whether this is a good segue for, for Tess to have a couple of uh, words, but I'd, I'll try and address the first part of the question, which is around unpacking some of the items on there. So we are happy to take that on board. Um, having said that though, one of the things that we are quite careful about is as a community to not make prescriptive um, directions with regards to what should happen. That's because um, any one technical prescription will have some people happy and others unhappy. And one of the value sets that BFBCA as a community organization has agreed upon in our charter is to represent all Brisbane communities. So we cannot put ourselves into a position where we um, make um, recommendations that will benefit these people, but not these people. That needs to be done by the engagement processes that um, are getting introduced, that are, that are um, running. We are then happy to point out how they are a farce, how they are disingenuous, how they are playing engagement theater with us, um, where we are put um, to decide between completely unethical options. Option one is unethical, option two is unethical. Um, we can do that. But we are, for instance, trying to refrain from um, taking sides with any Brisbane community because we are trying to stay united. So whether it is concerns people in, in Lothar, in Wynnum, and the Bayside communities, whether it concerns Sanford Valley, Upper Brookfield, we are trying to um, campaign on the issues that will pr uh, present reductions, net noise reductions for everyone. So the curfew, for instance, would um, reduce um, noise, flight caps would reduce noise, pointing out some of the ways that they've hollowed out the regulatory framework to suit their commercial um, interests is something that is of interest to everyone but we won't be able to unpack it to the extent that we are advocating for very specific technical, technical changes. The other thing I add to this is though, um, it's really important for everyone to understand why the LNP and especially the AL, um, Australian Labor Party are so consistently against some of these things that seem so straightforward. Isn't, isn't that the far more interesting question? Like why are they so adamant that we can't have what, Brisbane, what Sydney has got. So it, it is money, but I mean, it, it is really important on us. It's not like some sort of Bielka Peterson brown paper bag kind of situation. It is at a, at a much bigger scale, and the, the item on our, um, it might be too hard for me to kind of find it right now, but there, there is a particular um, um, protest reason that we've um, published that, that really un, uh, unpacks this, which I think is important for everyone to, to appreciate and, um, and look at, which is who owns the airport? So it, it goes, first of all, to the, to the, this is how we started looking into this, because we had this kind of situation of um, Anthony Albanese and the videos that we've uncovered from 1996 when Anthony Albanese entered Parliament as the MP for the seat of Grindler. And in his maiden speech, as well as subsequent speeches he gave in 96, he was all about um, flight caps and noise protections for his communities. And you can still watch these videos. So we've been asking what happened? How come this huge, 180 degree change from what you've said in Parliament in 96 to what your infrastructure minister is saying now in 23. Um, and this led us to kind of understand, well, hang on a minute, what's going on here? This is um, Albo in the maiden speech and some of the, um, some of the quotes there. What's also interesting is that Labour often ridicules what's called private members' bills. So when the Teals or the Greens put bills forward, because they don't have a big, uh, big numbers, they usually put these bills forward as what's called a private members' bill. So it's an individual MP putting forward um, such a bill. That was the very thing that Albo did when he entered Parliament. He had a private members' bill to put a flight cap on Sydney Airport of 80 flights an hour which while his private member's bill wasn't successful, John Howard actually legislated it. So Sydney has a flight cap of 80 flights an hour. We, we don't have anything. 
Coming back to, to then asking, well, what's going on? Why is this? You really have to look at reason eight, which is who owns Brisbane Airport. So you can see um, the ownership share, which has slightly changed recently, um, but it's, it's largely similar to what you see there. Um, one of the things to point out is that Queensland government, through the Queensland Investment Corporation, has a share of now over 25%. They've purchased um, the Patrizia share, so they are sitting now at um, uh, nearly 29%, which makes them the largest shareholder. So that's our state government, the one that is constantly saying this has nothing to do with us. They're actually the biggest shareholder of the Brisbane airport. But look at the other ones. IFM, has anyone heard of IFM? Well, chances are you're all part of IFM. IFM is a service company and they buy and sell shares on behalf of super funds. So if you have superannuation, who has superannuation? <laughs> That's right. Uh, so you might want to check um, who's your super with, and all the funds are required under the legislation to do what's called public interest disclosures, which means they need to tell you how is your money invested. My funding, uh, my super funding, because I work as an academic here, is with Unisuper. So I went to Unisuper and said, okay, public disclosure, what, what are you investing my shares in? Turns out, Brisbane Airport. I own parts of Brisbane Airport. <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if, if you are also, you know, owning parts of Brisbane Airport. But that's not where the whole thing stops. The actual IFM and other entities in there, and they have shares also in Sydney Airport, Perth Airport, um, they went shopping in Hobart and took out a big share there. Um, they are run by Labour people. So there's Greg Combat, who's the, Labor, the former Labour Victorian uh, uh, Premier. Um, Kath Botill, uh, Deborah Kears, Wayne Swan, Michael O'Connor, Sally McManus. Do those names ring a bell? Yeah, that's true. Greg, I think, has stepped down now, but um, this is up until recently. So this is kind of how we encourage everyone to try and make sense of things, and it changes, you know, individually depending on which super fund you're invested in. But if your super fund uses IFM, then chances are they have been um, anonymizing those investments because, in my case, um, some of the shares are listed just as IFM. So in the public disclosure uh, statements, it will say that a big chunk of money went to IFM and we've asked them to invest it on our behalf. And then the disclosure statement with my fund only says IFM. So then you have to drill down a step deeper and go, okay, where did that go? And then you unpack the next chunk. And then all of a sudden it says, ooh, Sydney Airport, Melbourne Airport, ooh, Brisbane Airport. And so, when you then realize that between Albanese in 1996 entering parliament and now a lot of the um, labor functionaries um, sitting in the boardrooms of industry super funds who have own, uh, ownership and, and very substantial ownerships of airports across the country, you kind of put one and one together and realize it's not in their interest to put caps and curfews in Brisbane. They're already trying to white end the community protections in Sydney to try and get rid of them. So that's the reason why in the scorecards, they're constantly saying no, because it would prevent them from getting the mula mula. <laughs> that's what it is. And it's not limited to aviation. We, we don't have provisions, we don't have provisions, I suppose, for, um, for this to be prevented. So the fact that we have um, Terry Butler, who uh, was un up until recently the um, MP for Griffith, um, telling us all um, how much she would do t for our fight and our concerns and our plea to um, fight against aircraft noise pollution. You all know she is a senior lobbyist now for the aviation industry. Um, She's taken up a job for the Jet Zero Council and as part of that um, advocating for the 
um, matters of sustainable aviation fuel. And she's sitting in the boardroom at Brisbane Airport as a consultant with Stephen Miles, now Premier, with Catherine King, Transport Minister, with the CEO, Gerd uh, Jan de Graaf, all in the one room, meeting on a regular basis to talk about how to turn Brisbane into an aerotropolis. Nothing wrong. That happens all the time. That's kind of how um, these things um, happen. And even just my three days in Canberra the other day, um, that house is a buzz, not with MPs, but with lobbyists that have lobby passes, and they wander the halls. They can go in and out. They don't have to have an invitation. With a lobby pass, you go to Canberra, you go through security, you don't have to wait for, like I did, for a um, staffer to pick me up from the security entrance. With the lobby pass, you go into parliament, not into the chambers, but the parliament office buildings. You knock on people's doors. Can I see, you know, such and such? And they're in there everywhere. So I think this is also, you know, um, an issue that I think should uh, make people think about how um, our democracy is, is largely run by corporations in order to maximize profit. And for a long time, we've been um, thinking that's a good thing. It's, you know, you know we've got to cut the red tape and we've got to make sure these companies are all doing, um, you know, uh, uh, working on a profitable business. But at some stage, we are then falling by the wayside and we are actually the ones that are um, suffering as a, as a result, as a consequence. All right, um, Tess, do you want to come forward and give us a, um, just in, in response to the other part of the question about um, technical changes? This might be good to, to hear from Tess, everyone. So Tess is on AAB, which is the um, Brisbane Airport Airspace um, Architecture Advisory, Witchcraft and Pottery, um, Super Senior <laughs> Consultative <laughs> Forum. Hi everyone, um, my name's Tess Bignall. I'm on the committee of BFPCA and also their treasurer. I got involved in this stuff back in 2020 when I was feeding my horses in the paddock out at Cedar Creek and a 737 went over. Had no idea. Then another one, then another one, then another one. Anyway, formed my own group out there. Had Peter Dutton on board. Um, then we got involved with BFPCA, and then involved with AAB. I'm also um, got an interest in what's going on at Archerfield Airport. Can't be on BA, BA, uh, BACAG because they um, can't be on both AAB and BACAG, right? Um, AAB is just another tool to tick a box for the government. It's been huge, it's been a year of total BS. Um, we had a terms of reference, the only, only two subjects that were banned was um, caps and curfew, couldn't discuss that, right? But when things like health come up, which is a symptom of the noise, banned. Push and push and push. Oh, well you need to take it to the minister and get it on the terms of reference, banned. Went to Peter Dutton for support. Go and meet Catherine King. Catherine King writes back and says, she's a member of AAB. Tell her to go there. Banned, gagged. What happens with AAB is that we raise contentious issues, just like the A320 um, retrofit. I'll give you an example there, what happened. So, um, cut a long story short, comes out that Airport says, yes, they're going to retrofit. Qantas rep says, no, we're not going to retrofit. So what happens? We then, get a, we then get an email from the chair saying, they're not retrofitting. So basically, shut up and go away. Right? So then what happens is it gets wiped off the list of um, issues and settled, and there's no form of rebuttal for us community reps. OK? Same thing happened with the intersection departure. Same thing happened with um, environment. You know, the environmental impact statements assessments for Brisbane are a total joke. The flight paths are designed, basically, basically approved by CASA, and I can prove this for the 2018 EA that was done for my area because we weren't included in the original assessment. 
So those flight paths were approved by CASA three months prior to the EA being approved by Air Services. Do you know what the reason was? Because the work was all done, but the person that needed to sign the environmental assessment wasn't available until three months later after CASA had done their job. Now, to give you another um, example, sod props, that horrible word. So what came out in Wednesday's meeting was, if you observe the runway and you think, perfect weather conditions, lack of traffic, perfect, everything's fine, we should be doing sod props. But we're not, why aren't we? It's not down to time, it's down to, comes back to traffic that's out over Moreton Bay that don't originate from the Brisbane airport or are arriving from the Brisbane airport. So there's flight path conflicts from the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast airport. They take precedence over what happens in Brisbane, right? But when you were engaged in the PIR, were you ever told that? Another secret. One thing you learn about ASA, it's not what they tell you, half of it's BS anyway, it's what they don't tell you, okay? It's like that 2018 EA. No one ever mentioned it during the PIR. It just slipped out one day. We had, Marcus got it through Freedom of Information, went through the process, and it's absolutely back-engineered to be approved so they don't go back to the minister. Everything is engineered. All the lies are engineered, right? So, um, so I don't want to miss your little <laughs> thing up. Um, I was just tracking down some, some notes. So basically, who's on AAB? So we've got a chair who's the ex-original um, noise ombudsman. We've got representatives from Brisbane Airport, um, Airlines, Virgin, Qantas, Jetstar, um, BAC, Air Services, and the five community reps, right? The five community reps are meant to be chosen strategically to cover areas of Brisbane, okay? Um, so, basically it's in place for the noise action plan for Brisbane. So last year, who attended community meetings put on by Air Services? Went through all the phases, didn't we? Phase one, two and three, all right? Why are tracks here? Tracks are coming out to do phase four. They're gonna look at all the old air, the whole of Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, fix it all up so we can all play in the sandbox together nicely. Bum bum. So, tracks are now here, it's been revealed, that they're redoing phase two, they're redoing phase three, and they are looking at phase four. Because basically, air services don't know how to do their job, right? So basically, we have lost 12 months full of BS, putting up with these idiots, right? Because um, they can't do their job. I firmly believe it's a delayed tactic, trying to run us out, trying to run us out of energy. But I don't know about you, but it just makes me more bloody angrier, you know? Um, we have spoken about economics and we've spoken about noise monitors. Who's had a noise monitor near their property? Anybody? Do not ask for one. You will get it, but then you will become a target. You will become worse of a target. Who knows that the, bris the noise monitors pick up four types of noise? Anybody? Right? Usually, we, you know, these noises are average. Pick it up a kil um, kilometre, listen over your head, follow it for a kilometre, average it. That's your noise exposure. So out where I am, I'm 35 plus kilometres from the airport. You think, God, it wouldn't be noisy out there, would it? So a sound exposure level for an A380 going over my property, have a guess how many decibels? Nearly. Anywhere between 92 and 97 decibels. That's not average, that's sound exposure level. 
or experience perceived level, okay? So these guys are well aware how loud these planes are. Having a noise monitor over your property is not going to prove to them how loud they are. They know damn well how loud they are. So don't be fooled into wanting a noise monitor because what we've seen is you're going to get targeted with more noise and all sorts of different planes, just for the hell of it, I reckon. But anyway, so um, we've spoken about the health issue. Um, you know, unfortunately, some of our members are coming up with some really bad health issues, and I think it is really due to stress. You know, um, sleep deprivation, people have moved. I've got a um, lady out at Sanford now. They're thinking of moving for the fourth time. And, I, and that's exactly the question they ask. Where do I go, Tess? And I go, well, have you got a bunker? <laughs> you know, um, my advice is if you have to move, move to rent. Move to go somewhere that is not permanent and you don't, we're not wasting money on stamp duty, right? Because nowhere is sacred in Brisbane. Nowhere is going to be safe. You're going to have to expect some type of overflight. And that's why caps and curfews are very important, right? There's a lot of examples around, around the world that have tiered caps on certain times. They have tiered noise they're allowed to make at certain times. It's not just cut and dry, you know. There are... Brisbane's a joke. Australia's a joke. And that's why we're getting people from all around Australia wanting to reply to this inquiry. Sorry, I'm out of my, my <laughs> remit. Right. Um, so basically, the noise action plan is for Brisbane that we discuss at AAB is going to take an extra year because last year was basically a waste. You're not going to see any results, concrete results, probably until what they are maybe probably in what they're going to introduce in probably mid-2025, okay? And then, you know, it's going to take 18 months to two years to implement these things by the time they go through their process. Yes, Tim? Correct, right? It's very important that you go to these these meetings that are coming out this year, and I said this last year, it's really important that you attend and you give your feedback. Now, the new flight paths that are going out, they all have to have environmental assessments done on them. And I keep saying, yeah, draw a line on a page, do the environmental assessment, use your flight path design principles, and I'm telling you now, they're all going to fail and they're all going to be referred to the EPBC Act, right? And there's going to be delays. Oh, Air Services sits there and goes, you can't say that. They won't fail. I said, well, you're putting them underground or out over the ocean where no one lives, right? Don't be fooled by these uh, new aircraft. They're going to be quieter, right? That's just BS, okay? The internationals are getting bigger and wider. So whatever quieter the engine is, you're going to lose that by the wide body. Okay? Because not only the engines are the ones that make the noise, it's the fuselage where the noise comes from. Okay? And the frequency. And the frequency. Yeah. Um, so you yeah, behind... The problem with this whole thing is that they have too many places to hide. They've got air services if they stuff up, oh, it's BAC's fault. BAC if they stuff up, it's air services' fault, okay? That is one of the large issues in Australia, okay? Um, 
Who voted for the segregated mode that came out in phase one? Thought it was a good idea. Anyone remember what the segregated mode is? It means that all the aircraft fly in on one runway, being the legacy, and they fly out on the other, being the, being the NPR, and they mainly use it during bad weather. They used it twice this year already. New Year's Day and Australia Day. Just happened to be two public holidays. What do you reckon about that? Bad weather. In a segregated mode, did you know they don't use flight paths, don't use designated flight paths? Did you know that? What do they do? They use compass headings. So that's why everyone took off from the NPR. You get a plane, you get a plane, and you get a plane, and you get a plane. They just shared the noise over all of Brisbane, okay? And that's why there were so many complaints. That's why BFPCA got a whole heap of new members. And that's why people thought, oh, is that what these people are complaining about? Okay. So I voted for it because I didn't realise that it used compass modes. Because what ASA told us, oh, no, they're all fly in on the NPR now and out on the legacy. It's their turn to have a go, you know. So we'll be able to pick which one we want. Okay. So I think um, you'll probably want to speak more, but is there any questions about AAB? Yep. Yep. No. Um, air services designed their flight paths on what they call their flight path principles. They went around Australia, they went to every capital city major and had meetings, except for here. What did we have? We had a pop-up caravan. Who went? None of us. Who got engaged? Industry got engaged, the airport got engaged, right? So they're making decisions on our behalf but not getting feedback from us, right? This is happening all around Australia. They're taking wrecking balls to every community in Australia, okay? Got people from Perth, Hobart, Newcastle, same thing, Western Sydney, you know? We are not treated with respect. We need to stand up and fight for our rights, basically. And it's just a pity we don't have the process in place to do that. Tony? Um, okay, continuous descent. I do believe so because in the beginning they were doing a stepped approach and that created more noise, which we all belly ached about. They are doing continu continuous approach. The argument that we have is the degree of approach, okay? There's various degrees around the world and also the degree of ascent. You know, we're working on three degrees here in, in Brisbane. And there's a lot of examples of how it can work better around the world. So, yeah. Mm. Yep. 
the design. Air services is very under-resourced. How much money do you reckon the CEO's on? Anyone want to have a million dollars a year for doing a bad job? Yeah. You had a question as well? Yeah, I just know you've done the sort of opposite. Yep. See, this has been the problem. Um, I don't know much about the south side, but like I had, I, yeah, I had no, no jets over my home. I now have a convergence of eleven flight paths, and now on count, there's nine levels of aircraft activity from 500 feet and above. Lead fuel is a big issue for this country, and everyone is just going, oh, not in my backyard. You know, oh, I don't care, it can't affect me. It's a silent killer. Mm. There's something about Pink and Bar, there's some deal. There's a deal between them and the airport. I don't know what it is, but there's a deal. Mm. Yep. Um, I want to wrap up the formal part, so maybe then leave another um, couple of questions, but um, please thank everyone. Uh, uh, join me in thanking Tess for facing up to, no, no, this is rude, for facing up to the um, armada of aviation representatives at the AAB meetings. Um, I, sorry. Oh, they, <laughs> they are actually for, for a certain type of noise abatement, those curtains, otherwise it would be very echoey. Maybe we need, yeah, these, these huge curtains for, for all the Brisbane suburbs. I put this page up as Tess was talking because, um, one of the things we got to come to a view about is how much longer do we want to put up with this? And I think it was Sean who found this thesis. It was a research thesis, a master's thesis done in the Netherlands, um, focusing on Amsterdam airport. And there's lots of parallels between Amsterdam and Brisbane because both are operated by the Schiphol Group, which in turn is owned by the Dutch government. But here in this quote, um, um, which is um, by Verdel 2021. It says, at the heart of the efforts of Schiphol's social engineering techniques is the notion of inclusionary control, which is about creating pseudo-participatory bureaucratic forums that promise reform and influence in decision-making. 
Uh, and then in the case of Schiphol, it's called the Schiphol Environmental Council. In the case of Brisbane, it's called BAPAF, it's called BACAG, it's called AAB, it's called Senate Inquiry, it's called PIR, it's called Noise Action Plan, it's called Give Us Your Feedback About Our Baseline Model, it's called something rather in next two weeks. So we've had over and over and over again exactly these kinds of pseudo-participatory bureaucratic forums. So this research thesis says this is um, set up to direct discussions and decisions about the developments of Schiphol, and it is an inclusive path to potential reforms that, although they never materialize, can convince people to wait before taking more radical action. Are we at a stage where we want to take more radical action? I think um, we are getting worn down, not just as people exposed to the noise exposure, but also we're getting quite fatigued by the engagement theater, by more submissions um, to the aviation white paper, now to set inquiries, now to other kinds of fora, and it just goes on and on without that we see any kind of change, which means we might have to come to that view of what else we want to do in order to actually air this kind of dirty laundry with the rest of Australia and push through the very reasonable demands, which is really just bringing us on par with Sydney and other international um, airports overseas where noise abatements are practiced, uh, implemented and practiced properly. Um, BFPCA has had uh, a close look at London City Airport, and I think we've come to a view that a lot of the provisions there, if we were to just implement them in Brisbane, we could all go home. We could probably live quite um, harmoniously with, um, with the airport in, in tandem. And London City Airport isn't too far-fetched because um, in terms of its proximity to an urban residential environment that is very highly densely populated, is probably a better example than Heathrow. Um, so those are some of the considerations, and I think um, as you go home and mull over some of the things we've discussed, it'll be um, important for our community to eventually arrive at a collective decision where we say, this is enough now, we're going to express our sentiments in other ways. We've started doing this uh, last year with our first protest. It was very vanilla. And it was very vanilla on purpose because we have an audience that's largely um, um, not very literate, I'd say, when it comes to community activism and protest. And a lot of people um, have never really attended a protest. But I think it is a part of a democracy to uh, um, exercise our right to protest. And it does um, lead to change. The fact that all the women in this room can go and vote um, on Saturday is not a result of some um, visionary men um, saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have gender equality when it comes to voting? It's because women went and protested. Same around slavery, same around LGBT rights, same around dis discrimination of um, the disabled, and the list goes on. A lot of the kinds of provisions that we take for granted were accomplished and achieved not because people just made it so in legislation, it's because people had to fight for it. And I think we are now coming to um, this stage where we are in the right. We've um, accumulated all the evidence that's needed to ascertain that we are in the right. We have the upper moral high ground of saying, this is something you can't debate with us. These are all facts. There are evidence, there are research, there is support material, there's FOIs, there's estimates, there is a long list, we're in the right. Second of all, we've exhausted all appeals pathways where you've put us into a corner where this is now the only way out. Unless you believe that, um, you know, air service is now backtracking to go back to phase two, if you think that's a good idea, then we could probably be sitting here for another half decade without that anything changes, and we still go to these meetings and provide feedback and talk to Donna Marshall um, until she goes into retirement, and we'd still be here. So that's just something to, to come to a view about because I think um, we're all tired in more ways than one, 
And this is something we got to face up to. I'm not going to necessarily um, declare and propose what this will look like, but I think you've, uh, if you've attended some of the previous BFPCA town hall meetings, there's already others that are ready to, ready to go. And I think more people need to come to this realization that we all need to be ready to go because otherwise we'll still be sitting here next year and we lose um, sleep, we lose um, uh, quality of life, um, our health is impacted and harmed, there's an uh, impact on property values of over 10% in our research, the list goes on. Are we continuing to put up with it? Um, I'm going to hand over to Troy to just um, close off with the other side of our little flyer, which has a bunch of QR codes. Um, I also quickly mention one code on there because of the confusion I suppose, I don't know if it is confusion, but um, as we are dealing with the Senate inquiry and the elections, the Commonwealth Ombudsman also now use this time to um, email everyone. And so I just want to clarify what that's all about. Um, BFPCA has been running this particular campaign that we call the regulatory failure campaign, and it had three actions. The first action that lots of you have already done is to send a complaint to the Department of Infrastructure and Transport, and that complaint was not a noise complaint. That complaint was about a lack of providing adequate regulatory oversight over air services, and we used a, a similar campaigns website, you might have seen this, to make it really, really easy for everyone to do this. Then you probably got a boilerplate response saying, um, we think that air services is adequately um, um, looked after by us because we've put in place a board of directors uh, made up of um, very important commercial people and they, we allow them to make decisions. They deal with it. Do you remember that response to, to some of your complaints? So we then use that as a way to escalate matters to the Commonwealth Ombudsman. That's a different person and a different office to the Aircraft Noise Ombudsman. The Aircraft Noise Ombudsman sits with air services. The Commonwealth Ombudsman is actually independent. It's its own office. It has more of authority and ability to do investigations. They've now started their investigation. So that's just the update on this. If you haven't yet, you can still go and scan the code on here that says complaint to the Commonwealth Ombudsman, which goes to this page, you can read um, what the submission will entail and why we are complaining to them. Um, and that will add more weight to um, the um, complaints process just by the virtue of the number of um, submissions that they are receiving. They will probably tell you that they've started to investigate now and they won't start individual investigations because this is really the same case and that's fine by us. It's similar um, to what happened in the past. It's like a multi-complaint investigation. So that's just an update on that's been happening now and I'm meeting with the Commonwealth Ombudsman's office this week on um, Tuesday or Wednesday um, to brief them further in a, in a video conference. Troy, do you want, uh, you got your mic? Yeah. Stamp stood up so soon. But um, I'm not going to talk to you about each of the QR codes on the back here um, outside of um, the Senate submission, but I'll get to that in a moment. But I did want to talk to you about what we're doing for local government election. Um, so in terms of that scorecard um, that we have, um, we've launched, um, we've taken, we had a pretty uh, a robust discussion about the best way to go forward. As Marcus kind of alluded to, um, the dance card is really full with lots of things happening um, and we are bombarding our community, so yourselves, um, as well as others who are at really different levels of uh, understanding of the issues. Some people are newly on board and, and um, don't have a clue about any of the backstory or any of the stuff that we've been talking about today and they're just like finding out about the issue for the first time. We've also got people like Marcus and myself and like many of you here today who um, have been here from the beginning and we've got people in the middle as well. Um, and so we've got this uh, communication and engagement challenge of uh, providing messages for all of those people that pe all those people can take action um, despite where they're at, at on that journey. So we're trying to be conservative with the amount of things that we're asking the community to do 
because we don't want to burn you all out and suck all the air out of the room. Um, so the, with the local government election, uh, local government election in other elections um, and other times, we've gone really hard with things like letterbox dropping and lots and lots of advertising and those kind of things. We've decided this time around to keep the powder a little bit dry because we've got some probably more consequential things happening very, very soon, which is the Senate inquiry, and we've also got the state government election just around the corner in October, which we've already alluded to. So are we going to be asking people to let a box drop? No. Um, we're not going to be coordinating it centrally like we have in the past um, uh, for this election, uh, which is only a week away anyway. Um, but if you want to do it, um, feel free. All of the stuff is on the website. You can print some out yourself and drop them to your neighbours. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. In fact, we'd, we'd encourage you to do that if you like. Uh, but we won't be coordinating that centrally this time. Probably will be coordinating centrally for the state election. Um, and there's more to come. Um, uh, as Marcus said, we won't try to confuse the issue um, by starting that comms too early. But what we are going to start doing is really hammering the comms around uh, Senate inquiry after next week once the local government election goes. So we've got a bit of work as BFPCA to do. Often people look to BFPCA and say, what do I write in my submission? Um, as Marcus kind of talked about briefly a moment ago as well, what we will be doing this um, time around is providing guidance, but that guidance around submissions won't be necessarily um, you need to write this. It will be about, these are some of the technical issues that you can bring up. These are some of the legislative issues that you can bring up. Here's some of the recommendations that we think as BFPCA might be a good idea. But what I want to stress to you in your submissions is that much like boilerplate responses that you get from Air Services Australia that are really easy to ignore, if we send boilerplate responses that are not... Uh, uh, tailored to our personal circumstances and stories, they're not as powerful in those kind of forums. So the most important thing you can do with your submission to the Senate inquiry is make it about your personal circumstance, the personal impacts to you and your family, to your mental health, to your financial position, if it's impacting your property price or whatever it is, about the specific things that are happening to you as a result of this problem, and then linking those to ways that, well, linking those to the causes of the problem, which are the regulatory shit fuckery that we've just spent two hours hearing about, um, and also the um, just lack of oversight. Um, and then the other thing you link them to is Here's some solutions that we think we could do that can help. And that can be ranging from small things like, hey, let's get better, um, let's ban the airports from being able to do consultation on behalf, of, or not consultation, you know, uh, marking their own homework like they have in the past that Marcus alluded to. Um, all the way up to really big ticket things like caps and curfews. Um, so you can use your own judgment based on what you think is best. But my biggest message to you is when you do your submission, feel free to wait for us. We're in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be putting some advice out about some of this stuff. But in the meantime, think about how you can be most impactful with your own personal story from this. That will be the most, you know, that will be the top end of what your submission is. So that's my homework for you today, um, <laughs> is not go and scan all this stuff. Um, it's have a think about how you can most succinctly but most impactfully tell your story about aircraft noise and how it's ruining your life. Because <laughs> um, that's going to be the most uh, moving thing for the people that read those submissions. Um, I'll leave it there and hand back to Marcus. Thank you, everyone, though, for coming out and for staying for two hours. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. And I'm going to say, scan all the things. <laughs> because they, they are actually quite important um, to keep us afloat and to purchase social media ads, as, as Troy mentioned, uh, on Facebook and so other social media platforms, to put ads into Village Voice, Village Pump, a local bulletin. Um, they've all jacked up their prices as part of the cost of living prices. Social media ads, as well as print ads, are more expensive. Um, 
So we're also looking into whether we would um, try and uh, re-engage on the legal front and engage uh, legal representation on some further leads that have come um, to the fore. It does help if you can um, chip in. I know it's a tough ask in this kind of environment, but um, every single bit um, does help. And um, one of the QR codes is around donations. You can also help us by purchasing one of these very snazzy t-shirts or caps, and I can see some of them already, uh, you guys wearing them. So if you'd like to purchase some fan articles that is contributing to our fundraising efforts as well. But do keep an eye out on the website. Um, we're happy to stick around for any further kinds of questions you might have, but I also know it's a busy Sunday for a lot of people. So if you need to head, head off, that's completely fine. Thank you so much for, for attending. I've been trying to capture a lot of this through our recording system. So I'll try and put this onto the, the Facebook page on our YouTube channel and the website so that you can share it with others. There, grab some more flyers if you'd like, if you've got other um, family members, colleagues, neighbors that couldn't make it, if you want to put it into the letterbox and give them a little nudge, um, there are some that you can take home. I might just leave them here at the front for you to take with you. Um, but yeah, with that, um, have a great Sunday and thank you all so much for making the way out here. Thank you.